like to announce a little uh, new partnership, or a big new partnership, as has been the tradition in the fast, past few years of Casa Italiana Zeri di Marimo. We are glad to partner with other organizations who value and love Italian heritage and culture, and so I would like to announce the partnership with Save Venice, and I would uh, like to be brief and give the word to Amy Gross, who is the director of Save Venice and who will then introduce their mission and the tonight's event and talk in more detail. Thank you, enjoy. Thank you. Well, I just would like to say we are so excited to be partnering with Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimo because what better fit Save Venice members care about art and architecture and restoring and conserving the treasures of Venice and Casa Italiana members care about all things Italian. So it's a perfect, <laughs> perfect duo. Thank you, Kostya and Stefano, who can't be here, for your help in organizing the event. And thank you also to my colleagues in the back, Dagna and Kim. Can you say hi? <laughs> Good, because I want everyone to know who you are. So I'm very pleased to introduce our professors for the evening. We have Professor Thomas Hansen and Dr. Abby Hansen. Thomas Hansen received his PhD from Harvard University. He is professor of German at Wellesley College, where he has been chairman of the department and has taught at all levels and all periods of the curriculum. His research interests have encompassed German exile literature, the period of 1933 to 1945, Edgar Allan Poe and German culture, and book design. After completing her doctorate in English Renaissance literature at Harvard University, Abby Hansen taught and carried on a career as an educational consultant, writer, and editor. She is the co-author of Teaching and the Case Method. Since retiring, she has been collaborating with her husband, Thomas, on translations from German into English. Together, they have worked on projects in fields including literature, modern history, and social anthropology. They agree that among these, however, there has been no greater challenge than the prose of Thomas Mann which is why they view their translation of Death in Venice as particularly significant. The Hansons are active members of our chapter in Boston, where they delighted members in the spring of 2013 with the first version of this presentation. Their e-notated e translation is downloadable on Amazon.com, and when you purchase your book, if you visit smile.amazon.com and select Save Venice as your charity of choice, Amazon will make a contribution to Save Venice. So I hope you'll join us for future events here and everywhere else. So please take material on the way out. And after the lecture, there will be a brief question and answer session, followed by Prosecco upstairs. So join us, and please, if you haven't already turned off your cell phone, please do. Thank you. Good evening. How is the microphone distance? All right, perfect. Can you hear? A little louder, please. All right. Is it better now? Yes. Good. Me too. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's an honor to be speaking to you this evening. Before we begin, um, well, I want to tell you that uh, we didn't bring plot summaries of the book. I had it in mind to do that, and I just realized I'd forgotten it. I was going to, I thought that would be so helpful, but you know, this is not a college seminar, so that's all right. Uh, Besides, the title gives away the ending. And I know it, I know it. it out. And so I'm not going to even show you a, a slide of that, of that material, because tonight we have a different goal. Our goal is to present images of Venice from around the year 1911, and we'd like to mix old and new photography and painting of the same subjects, and include a few that represent the inner life of the main character, Gustav von Aschenbach. Many of the images are just approximate associations, but they're nonetheless evocative. Why take this literal, realistic approach? 
because Mann leads us to do so when he later writes, nothing is invented in Death in Venice. The traveler at the Northern Cemetery in Munich, the dreary ship from Pola, the suspicious gondolier, Tazio and his family, the departure abandoned because of a mistake with the luggage, the cholera, it was all there. It just had to be brought into focus. So let's now take this journey to Venice with Mann and his character Aschenbach. Abby will do most of the reading from our translation. Speaking of which, first a word of background, our presentation is based on, you've heard it referred to, the, what we are calling our centennial translation, which appeared in a limited collector's edition in 2012. But, um, whoops, back to that, they're both there, good. Uh, it's also a downloadable ebook from Amazon, as you've already heard. Now, like his protagonist, Thomas Mann left Munich in the summer of 1911 to visit the Istrian coast and Venice. He spent his holiday on the Lido with his wife Katja and older brother, the writer Heinrich Mann. There, a long contemplated writing project crystallized in his mind, a tale depicting dignity debased by illicit desire. We begin with our protagonist, Gustav von Aschenbach, in his home city of Munich, the town Thomas Mann's mother moved to with her children when she left the northern port of Lübeck after her husband's death. Thomas was 19. Here is the first sentence of Death in Venice in German. Gustav Aschenbach oder von Aschenbach, wie seit seinem 50. Geburtstag amtlich sein Name lautete, hatte an einem Frühlingsnachmittag des Jahres 19 das unserem Kontinent monatelang eine so gefahrdrohende Miene zeigte, von seiner Wohnung in der Prinzerentenstraße zu München aus allein einen weiteren Spaziergang unternommen. Gustav Aschenbach, or von Aschenbach, as he had been officially known since his 50th birthday, left his apartment on Prinzregentenstraße in Munich on a spring afternoon in 19 a year which for months had turned such a menacing face toward our continent, for a long solitary walk. The date that the narrator leaves vague is 1911. The ominous event is the so-called Agadir crisis. France and Germany were vying for control of Morocco. Germany sent the gunboat Panther to the Moroccan port of Agadir on July 1st as a show of strength. It was early May and unseasonable summer heat gripped the city. Although its delicate foliage was just starting to bud, the English garden was as steamy as in August. At the Aumeister Tavern, Aschenbach paused a little while and watched the bustling beer garden. Then he made his way home across the open meadow as the sun set, and because he felt tired, he waited at the northern cemetery for the tram to take him straight back into the city. You see the Almeister Tavern at the lower left. Across the street from the cemetery, one can still find what the text describes. He found the tram stop deserted. Nothing stirred behind the fences of the gravestone carver's yards where crosses, memorial plaques, and monuments for sale make a second unpopulated graveyard. And gazing from this vantage point across the street, this is what he would have seen. The structure has changed, but retains much original detail. Note these two figures of animals, which are missing today. Here are Mann's words. The Byzantine building of the mortuary chapel across the way stood silent in the radiance of the departing day. Its facade, decorated in bright colors with Greek crosses and hieratic emblems, also displayed symmetrically arranged inscriptions lettered in gold. These were selections from scripture, referring to the afterlife. Waiting there for a few minutes, Aschenbach entertained himself intellectually by reading these phrases and letting his mind's eye lose itself in the mysticism that filtered through them. When he came out of his reverie, he noticed a man in the portico above the two animals from the apocalypse that guard the steps. At this point, Mann describes a real but symbolic harbinger of death who foreshadows many more to come. 
He has several attributes of Hermes, the psychopomp who guides souls to the underworld. The man was of average height, slim. The round, broad-brimmed straw hat on his head lent him the air of a traveler from far away. He had a gray rain cape over his left forearm, which he held angled against his waist. His right hand grasped an iron-tipped walking stick. This traveler inspires a hallucinatory vision of steaming swamps and jungle, where Aschenbach sees the glowing eyes of a crouching tiger and feels both dread and longing. He makes the unaccustomed decision to travel south. In chapter two, when the reader is mentally packed and ready to depart with him, the narrator introduces a dense psychobiography of the protagonist. This portrait of the artist does, does not move the plot forward, but is nonetheless essential to understanding the character. Now, these images suggest a few of Aschenbach's literary projects. They also happen to be projects that Mann himself had once started and subsequently ab abandoned. We learn that Aschenbach has written a novel about Frederick the Great, which includes conversations that Voltaire would have had with the king. There is also a reference to Frederick's invasion of Silesia, where Aschenbach's ancestors lived. Aschenbach's own prose has also been compared to Schiller's pure classical style. The narrator equates Aschenbach's typical heroes with martyrs. These images are all in Venice, where Mann could have seen them. A critic of Aschenbach's early works wrote that his heroes exemplified the concept of an intellect and youthful masculinity that clenches its teeth and stands silently in proud modesty while swords and spears penetrate its body. Grace in torment. The figure of Saint Sebastian is its most beautiful symbol. The chapter ends with a physical description of Aschenbach, which Mann drew from this composer, whom he knew and admired, and the news of whose death reached him on this very vacation in May 1911. Gustav von Aschenbach was dark-haired, clean-shaven, his hair brushed straight back, thinning at the crown, markedly graying, framed a high, craggy, and furrowed brow. He had a strong, nobly, nobly aquiline nose, the cheeks lean and wrinkled, the well-formed chin gently cleft. In chapter three, the voyage begins fitfully. He finally gave instructions to prepare his country house within the next four weeks. In 1909, Mann completed this summer house not far from Munich. It was here that he wrote Death in Venice, the house was sold in 1917, but remains nearly unchanged to this day. On a day between the middle and end of May, he took the night train to Trieste, where he stayed only 24 hours before boarding a ship for Pola the next morning. Trieste was an important city of the Austrian Empire, not ceded to Italy until after World War I. Pola, now Pula, was the Austrian naval harbor. Aschenbach, however, does not go directly from Pola to Venice. Like the Manns, he stops on what we know was the island of Brioni. Here's a contemporary guidebook showing the hotel where they stayed. And here's that photograph. And here's the fictional account. Aschenbach stayed a while on one of those Adriatic islands with colorfully shabby peasants who speak an exotic foreign language. The lack of a peaceful, intimate relationship with the sea, which nothing but a soft, sandy beach provides, depressed him and made it hard to believe that he had reached his true destination. A feeling tugged him away, but he did not know where, and that disturbed him. The choice had been staring him in the face. Venice. He loses no time and boards a rusty old steamer to Venice. He makes the 84-mile trip in bad weather. An intermittent misty rain fell, and he resigned himself to approaching a different Venice by water than he had ever encountered by land. He stood at the foremast, gazing into the distance, awaiting the sight of land. They enter the lagoon, and Venice starts coming into focus. Young men from Pola, on the ship with Aschenbach, 
were patriotically attracted to the military bugle calls that sounded across the water from the area near the public gardens. They had come up on deck and, animated by Asti, shouted hurrahs to the Bersaglieri, who were conducting military drills over there. And finally, Aschenbach arrives. So he saw it again, that most marvelous waterfront, that staggering composition of fantastic architecture with which the Republic greeted the awestruck gaze of approaching seafarers, the delicate magnificence of the palace, the bridge of size, the columns with lion and saint at the water's edge, the splendid jutting flank of the fairy tale temple, the view toward the portal and the great clock, and looking at this, he thought that arriving by land at the railroad station in Venice was like entering a palace through the back door. And Aschenbach thinks, the only way to approach this most fantastical of cities was over the high seas by ship. The engine stopped. Gondolas clustered around. The gangplank was lowered. The disembarkation could begin. Aschenbach made it known that he wished a gondola to take him and his luggage to the dock from which the Vaporetti shuttled between the city and the Lido, for he planned to stay at the seaside. Thomas Mann loved the city. His first trip there was in 1896. He took three more before 1911. The gondolas and the Vaporetti, he knew, resembled these. The old photo of the Vaporetto illustrates the origin of the term. These were originally little steamboats. And the black canopy on the gondola to the right, now obsolete, is called the Felce. Let's pause for a moment to recall how the iconic St. Mark's Square would have looked to Aschenbach, how it looked to Mann and his family in 1911. One major detail was quite different in the summer we are discussing. It was known that the Campanile had serious structural flaws. Engineers monitored the catastrophe, which occurred just as predicted. No one was injured, but rebuilding took almost a decade. This is how the Campanile would have looked to the Mans in 1911. Let's follow Aschenbach to his hotel. His contemporary photo shows a gondola trip toward the Lido. Who has not had to suppress a fleeting shudder at boarding a Venetian gondola for the first time or after long absence? This curious conveyance, so preternaturally black like nothing except coffins, reminds one of death itself, of the funeral bier and somber cortege and the last silent journey. And this coffin black lacquered armchair with its dull black upholstery is the softest, most luxurious, most voluptuous in the world. Aschenbach quarrels with his uncivil gondolier who insists on taking him to the Lido rather than the Vaporetto stop. Their argument introduces a recurring theme. The gondolier says, I carry you well. And Aschenbach thinks, you carry me well, even if you're after my money and plan to strike me from behind with an oar and send me to the house of Aides. That's Hades, of course. And this image shows Hermes guiding a soul to Charon. So they arrived, pitching and tossing in the wake of a vaporetto on its way to the city. From here, Aschenbach then makes his way across the Lido toward his hotel and the beaches. Let's orient ourselves. We're looking west here across the Lido toward the lagoon and Venice. So after arriving at the Vaporetto landing, Aschenbach walks toward the Adriatic and enters the Hotel des Bains through the back garden. He is shown to his... Excuse me. Did I do that right? Nope. Page 27. Yeah, so sorry. Yeah, that's 20... That's this is 27. Yep. Uh, the Great Resort Hotel, built in 1900, is, is now being rebuilt as luxury condominiums. Um, <laughs> for, yes. Uh, yes. For, fortunately, we trust that project is still underway. Fortunately, the facade, however, is being 
is being preserved. Now, below is the avenue between the hotel and the beach around 1911, and the text describes it as white with spring blossoms when Aschenbach arrives. He's shown to his room. The view from the tall windows opened onto the sea. He walked over to one of these, looked out onto the beach, almost deserted in the afternoon, and at the sea in shadow, now at high tide and sending long, low waves in peaceful, even rhythm against the shore. And here the narrator reflects. The observations of the solitary, taciturn man are more nebulous and poignant than those of one more sociable, weightier, stranger, and never without a trace of sadness. Solitude brings out originality, daring, and poetry, but also the perverse, the excessive, the absurd, the taboo. He took tea on the terrace, facing the water, then walked down the steps and followed the waterfront promenade for quite a distance toward the Hotel Excelsior. The postcard with the Zeppelin actually dates from 1923. Let's pause for a moment to notice the etiquette of dress in 1911. Here's a very grand example of the female epitome of formal dinner attire. However, the standards for men were also high. A German guidebook from the period cautions the traveler about the strict dress code in Italy. It is recommended that in Italy, one pay strict attention to his attire, including the impeccable quality of his underwear, tie, headgear, etc. Even the foreigner who moves in elegant circles should devote his attention to his appearance and be assured that erring on the side of too little rather than too much is enough to characterize him as being insufficiently chic. Here, here is Mann's text. When he returned, it was time to change for dinner. He did so slowly and deliberately, even so, he arrived in the lobby a bit early. He found a large number of hotel guests gathered there. A broad cosmopolitan horizon opened up. The muted sounds of the major languages intermingled. Evening dress, the international uniform of civility, outwardly unified the varied human types into a single decorous entity. Polish was being spoken nearby. During the day or on the beach, Aschenbach wears a light linen suit. <laughs> now, death in Venice crystallized for Thomas Mann when he saw the young Polish aristocrat Vladislav Moos, who was staying at the same hotel with his family. Three young girls between the ages of 15 and 17 and a long-haired boy of perhaps 14. Aschenbach noticed with amazement that the boy was perfectly beautiful. Vladislav was actually 11, the fictional boy Tazio is 14, and the man who inspired the character, you, you see him as Mann did in the center here, um, and here he is at, in the lower right in old age. That gentleman learned of all this in 1928 when the story was translated into Polish, but he paid very little attention to it. He lived a long and active life. And here's how the text describes his mother. A tall woman in gray and white, the style of her dress had the sort of simplicity that sets the tone wherever piety is counted a component of gentility. Her appearance gained an air of fantastic luxury through her triple span strand of delicately shimmering pearls. She smiled serenely with her well cared for, but somewhat weary and sharp nosed face. Aschenbach is captivated by the boy. His face was framed by honey-colored ringlets with a straight nose, beguiling mouth, and an expression of lovely godlike austerity that reminded him of Greek sculpture of the noblest period. His beautiful hair, like that of the spinario, curled around his brow, over his ears, and onto the back of his neck. Aschenbach is thinking of this well-known figure from the first century AD. His English sailor suit with billowing sleeves was decorated with braid, bows, and embroidery, lending his delicate frame a resplendent, spoiled aspect. This was a favorite fashion for boys and girls from the early 19th century onwards. Mom's children, shown here with their mother in 1915, all wear sailor suits. 
It can't escape notice that they are of the same physical type as the 11-year-old Baron Moles. Aschenbach's perception of Tazio are always filtered through the aesthetic ideal of Greek art and philosophy. Above his collar rested the fair blossom of the incomparably lovely head, the head of Eros, the creamy glaze of Parian marble, with fine and earnest eyebrows, temple and ears softly bedecked by his curly hair. If you considered the original Polish lad rather far from this Greek ideal, you have company. The Italian film director, Lucchino Visconti, cast a young Swedish actor whose face became the indelible image of Tazio for those who know the character through the movie. Several scenes occur in the hotel dining room. They had begun to serve, but the young Poles lingered around their wicker table, and Aschenbach settled in the depths of his easy chair with beauty before his eyes, waited with them. Next morning, Aschenbach sits in front of his cabana on the beach. The tableau of the beach, the scene of carefree, sensuous, pleasure-seeking culture at the edge of the water, entertained and pleased him as never before. The flat gray sea was already populated by wading children, swimmers, colorful figures who lay on the sand, sand banks with their arms crossed under their heads. Here are the real Polish children and their governess on that same beach. After Visconti's film appeared in 1971, the boy on the right, Janek Furakowski, who lived in England, sent this photo to a British newspaper. In front of the long stretch of cabanas with platforms where people sat as if on little verandas, there was movement both playful and languid. Indolent tranquility, visits and small talk, carefully groomed morning elegance beside bare skin, which enjoyed the audacious, casual freedoms of the place. Aschenbach watches the children at play. To the right, an elaborate sand castle built by children was decorated all around with little flags in the colors of every country. Aschenbach hears the boy's name, but doesn't understand it. It sounds like Adju, the nickname for Vladislav, in other words, the boy's real name. Mann changed this to Tazio, the nickname for Tadush, Thaddeus, which he found more euphonious. People kept shouting his name until it dominated the whole beach almost like an incantation with its soft consonants and drawn out ooh at the end, both sweet and wild. Tadziu, Tadziu. Vendors of mussels, pastries, and fruits knelt nearby to spread out their wares. Aschenbach breakfasted on large overripe strawberries, which he bought from a vendor. It had gotten very warm. Indolence fettered the intellect, while the senses enjoyed the vast and numbing distraction of the ocean's silence. That afternoon, he took the Vaporetto over the vile-smelling lagoon to Venice. He disembarked at San Marco, had his tea on the square. Perhaps a Café Florian, the interior of which, glimpsed here through the window under the arcade, has not changed much since the early 1900s. On the other hand, because Mann does not specify Florian, Aschenbach might have taken his tea across the square at Quadri. <laughs> And then, in accordance with his daily habit here, Aschenbach set out on a walk. A noxious humidity infused the back streets. The air was so thick that the smells, the oil smoke, clouds of perfume, and many others hovered in layers without dissipating. To his embarrassment, he broke out in a sweat. His eyes failed him. He felt the chest pains of anxiety. He was feverish. The blood pounded in his head. He fled across bridges into the alleys of the poor where beggars accosted him, and the putrid exhalations of the canals made it painful to breathe. In a quiet square, one of those forgotten, deserted, seemingly enchanted spots that can be found in the interior of Venice, he sank down at the edge of a wellhead, mopped his brow, and realized that he had to leave. And so he returns to the Lido, Aschenbach packs and heads for the railroad station. 
Followed by the hotel employee carrying his hand luggage, he made his way across the island to the Vaporetto. He reaches it, he takes his seat, and what followed was a grief-stricken journey of torment. It was the usual trip past San Marco up the Grand Canal. Aschenbach sat shading his eyes with his hand. The public gardens lay behind him. The piazzetta opened up before him again in majestic elegance and glided away. There followed the great expanse of palaces, and as the watercourse made its turn, the magnificent marble span of the Rialto appeared. The traveler beheld, and his heart broke. When Aschenbach arrives at the station, he finds that his luggage has been misdirected to Como. Elated, he goes back to the Lido to await its return. And these are his thoughts. Now and then his chest still heaved with laughter at the mishap, which, he told himself, could not have happened to a luckier devil. An omnibus awaited at the returning traveler and took him straight to the Hotel des Bains. When he sees the Polish boy again, he acknowledges that it was because of Tazio that his departure had been so difficult. Having decided to stay on the Lido, Aschenbach rises early to greet the dawn. Mann called chapter four his classicizing chapter, and it begins with Apollo Helios. Now every day the naked god with blazing cheeks guided his team of four fire-breathing steeds across the vault of heaven, his yellow curls rippling in the gusts of the east wind. The evenings were idyllic and brought the joyous assurance of a new day of sun and casually ordered leisure, graced by abundant possibilities of delightful coincidence. On the beach, Aschenbach's infatuation intensifies, and so do the classical illusions. A statement in a letter from Mann explains the reason for this literary technique. He writes of the work in progress, quote, it's a strange subject from Venice, a novella earnest and pure in tone that treats a case of pedophilia in an aging artist. You are saying, uh-oh, but it's very decorous. Now, how does he keep this decorous? Through the dense web of illusions and platonic abstractions. For example, his eyes embraced the noble form there at the edge of the blue, and giddy with delight, he felt that with this vision he had grasped beauty itself. Aschenbach then compares the boy to Amor, god of love, and in his reverie contemplates Pledro's Phaedrus dialogue, in which the old philosopher Socrates instructs his beautiful pupil Phaedrus on desire and virtue. Aschenbach will stay on the Lido as long as the Polish family does. Dawn is here conveyed through myth. He sat by his open window to await the sunrise. The glorious event filled his soul with wonder. A single fading star hovered in the void. A breeze came up. Winged tidings from afar that Eos was rising from her husband's side. Roses rained down at the edge of the world. Delicate little clouds hovered attendant Amoretti in the rose-blue haze. The glow turned to fire. The solitary watcher sat, illuminated by the glory of the god. This slide collects images of mythological allusions in the chapter. These are out of context, but they give an idea of Aschenbach's associations and rationalizations for his feelings. The narrator has compared the clouds at dawn to Amoretti, and now the waves are frisking goats sacred to Pan, the god who can induce nightmares and terror, panic, and is associated with licentious sexuality. He will compare Tazio to both Hyacinthus and Narcissus, beautiful youths who die young, Later, in a fevered state, he imagines evil spirits, harpies, the storm wind over the Adriatic. In the fourth week, the plot approaches its conclusion. Aschenbach notices that tourists are leaving the hotel. One day at the barber's, where he was now a frequent visitor, he picked something up in conversation that took him aback. The man mentioned a German family that had just left after a short stay, then added, you are staying, sir. You are not afraid of the contagion. Aschenbach looked at him. The contagion? 
he repeated. The garrulous fellow pretended to be busy. The image of this barbershop is perfectly contemporaneous. It happens to be the barbershop on the Titanic. <laughs> Fact and fiction overlap once again. In Italy, over 6,000 people died of cholera in 1911 alone. But in Mann's text, the authorities try to conceal this. He sensed a strange smell, a sweetish medicinal odor that reminded him of poverty, wounds, and doubtful hygiene. On the street corners, printed notices were posted on which the city fathers warned the public of certain illnesses of the gastric tract and against eating oysters and mussels and using water from the canals. Officially, the only cause for worry is the Scirocco. As Aschenbach's health declines, his passion increases. He now stalks the boy through Venice. He concluded that they must attend mass in St. Mark's. Hurrying there, he entered the golden twilight of the holy place from the blaze of the piazza outside. He found the one he longed for at worship, he stood at the rear on the cracked mosaic floor. The colossal splendor of the Oriental temple weighed sumptuously on his senses. Here's a contemporary image. Incense billowed up, but through all the haze, Aschenbach saw the way the beautiful boy in the front turned his head and met his gaze. We follow Aschenbach in pursuit. When the crowd poured out through the open portals into the shimmering piazza, teeming with pigeons, the infatuated man lurked near the entrance. He follows them through the clock tower gate and into the merceria on their stroll through Venice. He had to stop when they dawdled. If they changed course, he was forced to let them pass by taking cover in food stalls and courtyards. He sought them across bridges and in dirty cul-de-sacs, endured minutes of mortifying agony upon suddenly seeing them coming toward him in a narrow passage where there was no escape. He followed the dictates of the demon whose pleasure it is to trample man's reason and dignity underfoot. This word demon, great Greek daimon, denotes the manifestation of the power of a great god. The force, the demon referred to here, is Dionysus. At some point, Tazio and his group took a gondola, and Aschenbach, who hid behind a wellhead as they embarked, did the same once they had cast off. Thus, he glided and swayed, reclining on soft black cushions, on the trail of the other black high-proud boat to which passion fettered him. Occasionally, it would disappear from his sight. High overhead, he notices white and purple elderberry blossoms hanging over walls from little gardens, and Moorish window casings that are discernible in the gloom. The gondola passes marble steps that lead down into the water. He passes a beggar and an antique dealer, who he assumes wishes to swindle him. That was Venice, the flattering, deceitful beauty, the city half fairy tale, half tourist trap. The adventurer's eyes seemed to drink in the opulence. He also remembered that the city was sick and hiding it out of greed. And casting all restraint to the winds, he kept a sharp lookout for the gondola that meandered, meandered on ahead. Back at the hotel, he searches in vain for information about cholera in local newspapers. But the stench of disinfectant in the city drives him to seek the truth. And so he asks, asks a clerk at the English off, tourist office nearby. After temporizing, the English clerk gives him a candid report this clipping from a New Zealand newspaper shows how far the news had traveled. The clerk tells him, for several years now Indian cholera had shown a heightened tendency to proliferate and travel. It was bred in the warm swamps of the Ganges Delta, propagated by the foul miasma of that lush, untamed primeval world in whose bamboo thickets the tiger crouches. The plague raged implacably and with unusual ferocity. Aschenbach learns that the hospital's isolation wards are full, orphanages overcrowded, and the traffic to San Michele, the cemetery island, ominously brisk. But the consequences that panic could have for the tourist trade carry more weight in the city than allegiance to truth. 
Shortly thereafter, Aschenbach has a terrible dream. It unfolded in his very soul and breaking in from outside violently overpowered his resistance, a deep intellectual resistance, destroying it as it passed, leaving his being and the culture of his whole life ravaged and annihilated. In this dream, he picked out one word indistinctly, the name of what approached, the alien god. That god is Dionysus in his role as destroyer of men through debauchery. The dream depicts a Dionysian orgy. Women with their heads thrown back, moaned, shook tambourines, swung blazing torches and naked daggers. Men with horns on their foreheads banged on brass cymbals, while smooth-cheeked boys with ivy-wreathed staves jabbed at rams. The celebrants howled the call with its drawn-out ooh sounds at the end, both sweet and wild, and the deep, seductive tone of the flute penetrated and dominated everything. The dream hastens Aschenbach's surrender to passion. The next morning, he goes to the barber and laments his gray hair. The barber asks whether Aschenbach will allow him to restore that which belongs to him. This persuasive fellow rinsed his client's hair in two different liquids, a clear one and a dark one, and it was as black as in his youth. He set it in soft waves with his curling iron. This contemporary advertisement shows that hair dye was marketed as a natural restoration as opposed to concealment. The barber, however, also applies rouge to his cheeks. One afternoon, while tracking the beautiful boy, Aschenbach penetrated deep into the inner tangle of the diseased city. His sense of direction failed him, and alleys, canals, bridges, and little squares in the labyrinth all looked alike. Here, feverish and sweating, he purchases for the second time some soft, overripe strawberries, this time from a greengrocer's, and eats them as he walks. He collapses at the spot where he had originally vowed to leave Venice. He came upon a deserted little square with an enchanted atmosphere. He recognized it. It had been here that weeks ago he made his abortive plans to leave. On the steps of the wellhead he sank down and laid his head on the stone rim. It was silent. Among the tall, weather-beaten houses of various heights that surrounded it, one was palatial, but behind its windows, framed by pointed arches, nothing dwelt but emptiness. We come to our final slide. After breakfast one morning, Aschenbach learns that the Polish family will leave that day. He goes to the beach for the last time. Here's the description. An autumnal atmosphere, a sense of something outlived, lay upon the now almost deserted recreation spot. We read of Tazio walking alone in the shallow water. He paused to stare out to sea, and suddenly he turned his torso, twisting beautifully from the waist, one hand on his hip, and glanced over his shoulder toward the shore. The observer sat there, his head leaned against the back of his chair as he slowly followed the motion of the boy pacing in the distance. Now it rose as though to meet that gaze so that his eyes showed only the impassive inward focus of deep slumber. This is still Mann's description, but it seemed to him that the pale and lovely psychagogue was smiling and summoning him from the distance as if, taking his hand from his hip, he pointed outward and drifted ahead into the inviting vastness. And as so often before, Aschenbach started to follow him. Minutes passed until people rushed to help the man slumped sideways in his chair. They carried him up to his room, and that same day a, respectful, a respectfully stunned world received the news of his death. The last sentence in the original, und noch desselben Tages, empfing eine erschütterte Welt die Nachricht von seinem Tode. We do have time for questions. We have time for some questions if you wish. If there are any. Cycle 
Sakopop is the, the soul guide the, from, the, from the Greek. So there's no connection with Pop? No, 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 no. Also called psychogog, which is a little, little, little clearer, yeah. But that's, psychopomp is ma man's word, so can't quit you. Right, right. I guess I actually have also, when this book came out, I mean, he obviously was trying to be calling it Peter and in his writings. What was the reception, and what was the general thoughts on pedophilia? Was it? Well, pedo pedophilia was, and I venture to say, perhaps still is, quite taboo. And uh, therefore, the reactions were, were, were I, they ranged from, outrage to mixed. And it took a few years for the, the, the work to establish itself and for people to learn to read it in the way that I have just tried to uh, stress here. It did it's sell very well. Yeah, it did sell. Well, thank you. It's, it's thank awfully you. literal. We know that, but it's. Uh, <laughs> yes, and, and many you months. See what we didn't put in. Many months. I, I I did most of the the picture research while we were doing the translation. We were we were both doing the picture research from yeah, all over. True. A lot of it in the web, but we also did a lot of it ourselves. It gave us an excuse to go to Venice with our <laughs> cameras you noticed. and take it off our taxes. <laughs> and uh, some of these illustrations are ours. The, the Hotel des Bains, for example, is ours. And we, we, we followed in the steps of Thomas Mann. Did not meet any beautiful little boys. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Mann's style. What about Thomas Mann's style? Did it, <laughs> the long Ciceronian sentences. I would like to know if there are any, how many, if any, German speakers there are in the audience. Well, maybe some people have actually read it in okay. German. Yeah. Uh, if, yeah. if, if you were to listen, or when you were listening to the first sentence in the German, did you realize that it was a whole paragraph long? Well, not but there is a paragraph that has over a hundred words in it. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Mann uh, liked to show off his erudition a bit, and he was writing in this very 19th century style, um, in the tradition of a couple of stylists whom he truly admired. That makes Thomas Mann really a creature of the 19th century, um, on the cusp of modernism, certainly because of many of his, uh, his themes, but a person who quickly became sort of historicized stylistically, in other words, what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is nobody writes like this anymore. Well, one couldn't get away with it. But his uh, sentences are finely polished, but they're long. Uh, in, in German, they're sometimes called snake sentences there, because one doesn't, one, one finds the head and one searches for the tail, and one doesn't know which way sometimes they're going. But that's partly the way German syntax works, and he plays with the conventions of that in a, in a somewhat poetic way sometimes. If it's a separable prefix, for example, you have to learn very, you wait a long, long time to find out whether it's yeah. aus or auf. <laughs> you have to turn a few pages before you get the verb that you've got to translate and start your sentence with. And what we did, what we had to do, uh, and what you always have to do in foreign languages that have long run on sentences is sometimes chop them up into shorter sentences. Otherwise, you know, readers in a foreign language couldn't possibly make. And to come back to your question, what Abby's describing is a process that translators call domestication. That is to say, uh, taking the original, the language of the original text and bringing it closer to the uh, intended audience in the translated language, the new, the new target language. One cannot bring the expectation of German style and then these long classical sentences to a modern American or English speaking ear really. When you read the first sentence in German, and then you read the sentence in English, yeah. I couldn't tell if the English sentence was one, the English translation was one sentence, or whether you broke it into, because this is what I was thinking. While you it, it, well observed. I think we kept it one sentence because it's sort of an iconic sentence in German literature, and that sentence would lose a lot if we're too cruelly domesticated. <laughs> so, so, we, so we kept it as, kept the Germanic, I hope it worked. 
<laughs> it uh, took a lot of juggling. The questions are always, you know, not how good is your German, but how good is your English? In other right. words, where, do you, where can you place these time phrases? Where can you place the relative to the other details in the, in the English sentence? In German things are going to be clearer, but it's a, all kind, kinds of decisions have to be made there. But if there you... There is a similar uh, uh, challenge when translating yes. Spanish. It, it's not constructed the same way. That's right. right. The sentences are much longer than they would be in English. That's right. That's right. Um, I, I'm curious as to what made you decide that Seven Venice needed a new translation, or would benefit from a new translation, and, and how you would compare your translation with what I read in college 45 mm -hmm. years ago. Well, I can talk specifically about that translation. You know, I've almost forgotten what motivated us to actually do it. I forgot. Uh, sunstroke. Sunstroke. <laughs> right stroke. I, uh, anyway. Um, well, it, in, 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 in part, it was a certain dissatisfaction with a couple of the translations that are out there. Uh, the famous translation that Thomas Munson, whose English was, was really rather good, but far from native, um, was done in an, uh, he almost oversaw it in a, in a way. It's, done, it's late, it's done, it's done late. Uh, well actually, it was an early one done in the 20s, which I don't think he was really much aware of. But this one done by Helen Lowe Porter was the, the translator who actually worked with him as a, as a correspondence between the two. She gets an awful lot wrong. She tries to uh, stay as close to the German as possible, so she, so she produces these 100-word uh, English sentences, which I don't think work terribly well, and most, most translators have felt that they don't, they don't work terribly well. Since those translations have gone out of copyright, people have turned again to Thomas Mann, and the, the great big works, the thick novels, for example, have been retranslated not by us, by any means, but uh, this is the only one we tr we've tried our, our hand at. Does that go anywhere toward answering your question? Why did we think that a new translation was necessary? Actually, it sprang from the fact that we belong to, say, Venice. And we thought, Gee, what would be something interesting that we could contribute? Why don't we take a look at Death in Venice? And we read some copies That's of right. and we said, you know? That's right. And as we were doing that, as we were planning, to start all over again. You know, we hadn't actually start. planned to translate. You're absolutely right. We hadn't planned to translate, and then we, 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 just, we thought we would do a kind of in the footsteps of. But then we realized we disliked the translation so much that we. Yeah, we did. so we can yeah. do better than that. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and hubris, a, a year hubris. later, we thought, oh my God, <laughs> why did we ever think we could do better than that? Well, the beauty was that we were not under a publisher's deadline. That's that's the nice thing. So we, we could take for as long as we wanted, and therefore it, it came out in a fairly polished way, I, I'd like to say. Other questions about trans... You, you've just spoken about translation from German to English. What about, in your opinion, the translation from, uh, from the book to the screen? Does the movie... <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up. It doesn't do the, the book justice at all. It, it cannot possibly, because so much of... Oh, pardon me. What goes on in, in the book is interior. And um, it, this Conti changed so much. He has that, that lush Mahler score, of course. He keeps repeating that Adagetto from the, was it the fourth, sym fifth symphony? Fifth symphony. And, uh, but he turns, he turns Aschenbach into a composer. And therefore, there's no tension any longer between the serene Apollinian artist and the Dionysian, because by Nietzsche's definitions, the, the composer is automatically Dionysian. And I, I'm not uh, trying to impress anyone with this, but the point is Thomas Mann was dealing, was trying to understand art and the artist in pre-Freudian terms. And the pre-Freudian terms that suggested themselves to his generation, that were really sort of intellectual concepts that gripped people, were the, these concepts of the Apollonian versus the Dionysian. They go back to 1872 in a, in a great tract by Nietzsche. And so that helped people understand the creative processes. That I've gotten off your off May your point I, a little add bit here. To that? I've gotten off your may point, I but, but then, then I'll come back to Ever? the movie. Yes, okay. go <laughs> now. Yes, now. <laughs> oh, thank you. Visconti is an opera <laughs> director, and he made it essentially into an operatic work. And so I think Visconti was enthralled with the beauty of Venice, as who is not as a filmmaker, but also in turning uh, Aschenbach, who is in the book so 
utterly rooted in literature and in words and is frustrated and maddened because he can't find the right words to describe the beauty of the boy. And he is absolutely part, part of what makes him sick. I mean, you can argue about whether it's cholera, broken heart, or the frustrations of an artist. But part of what, what, what he is upset about and talks about is that the word can never capture the beauty that nature just effortlessly creates. And it is the fact that the word can't capture it. And Aschenbach is a writer, and his challenges are a writer's challenges, so that if, like us, you have grappled with it, and if you are literary historians and scholars, to see him turned into a composer is bizarre. And also, Aschenbach is described as the solitary man, the lonely man. If you actually read the book and you read Aschenbach's dialect, he says hardly anything to anybody ever. Hello? Thank you, please. Is there really a plague? That's about it. He never talks to the boy. It's all done in the third it's person. All it's all internal. All internal. And in yeah. order to uh, turn that into a film, Visconti gave him a confidant, a pal. This is not a man who would ever have a pal, a best buddy. That's, that's my two cents. Sorry. I don't want to go on too long about, about, about the film. It's a, it's a completely different work. Right. Uh, and when you begin to compare the two, you're going to find uh, you know, positive and negative aspects. It depends on how you know, strict you want to be. But he doesn't, he doesn't feel he needs to uh, represent the work. He, he does something new. Uh, have you translated other Thomas Mann works? Well, we've, planning on? We, we've, started a, we've started with a couple other short stories. We'll, we'll see where it goes. Yeah. Um, let me ask another question. Is this, do, do people still read Thomas Mann in any language? <laughs> is that, I, I mean, has anyone read this before? Yeah? Yeah? Good. That famous um, translation that you, that you alluded to before is in that little um, Viking vintage paperback, the yellow cover. Uh, and uh, people, people know it from that, basically. Yeah. What else would you like to know? Otherwise, we, we're very much on time. Oh, well, actually. Can you mention a few errors of translation, misnomers, and things like that, that um, you were able to correct? Yes, sometimes people get words wrong. Uh, I can't, you know, how specific? I can't, Elderberry. One thing, right? Yeah, the, no, nobody had ever figured out the particular name of a certain flower he talks about. It took a little bit of research, but I had to get out of th through the Latin. Everybody thought it was just to, anyway, not what you call of the first importance by any means. On the other hand, it's a little more accurate. But that's just, that's just symbolic for the kind of detail that one can bring to a project like this. Otherwise, um, the, the other translations have true misunderstandings about what the sentences mean. Because one can tell whether a translator is actually that fluent in the idiomatic intricacies of German. If, if they're terribly flattened, and then uh, sometimes they're, they misrepresent completely. I can't be terribly concrete right now, I'm sorry. I don't have a question, but I have a request. Could you talk a little bit um, about the setting? Could you talk about Venice as a, a character in this, or as a, um, why, why did this story play out in Venice? Oh, why Venice? I suppose, well, I, I won't as opposed to any other city you might fill in the blank with. Uh, it, it had to be Venice in a sense, because especially in the German imagination, especially the German imagination, but not only by any means, uh, Venice is associated with a city of decay and aestheticism. And it's the city in which, which Wagner dies. And it's the city uh, that, uh, that Germans always go to. It's a city that also has a kind of lascivious, had in this particular this period, a very lascivious, kind of uh, reputation. These hotel barbers were also procurers. Yeah. Sure. Why Venice, not Vienna? I mean, really, it's, it's, yeah, why it, not it, Vienna? it had to be well, the south. It had to be Italy. Vienna society, that's <laughs> Does that help at all, Stephanie? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And as I say, uh, as you heard, Thomas Mann loved, loved this, the city. Yeah. Thank you so very much for coming tonight. <laughs>